I hope that uh, you were blessed by looking into that word this week. Um, for those of you who don't know, go, turn, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we're going to be looking at the passage in a very thematic way, so we may not be looking at every verse of the entire section, okay? Um, but as you're looking at that, let me just give you a sense of where this is going. We've all heard it. Ready or not, here I come! <laughs> Hide and seek, right? It's one of the first games we learn to play as children. In fact, when we're young parents with our infants, we play peekaboo. Same kind of thing, right? It, it, it's just part of that thing. You know, when, when someone leaves, however, for an indefinite period of time, it's not a game anymore, is it? Um, instead, it becomes a responsibility. Uh, think of those who have to go to war. They, they don't always know the exact date they're leaving. They often don't know when they're returning. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, military itself is a very regimented life, but war, that's a total different thing, isn't it? And so we don't always know. Usually, the wife has to take care of things in the home while her husband is off. Um, she's got to pay the bills. She's got to take care of the children. She's got to repair broken things. A lot of the things that are, she relied on her husband for, not anymore. She's got to, as it were, man up. She's got to go and do those things that maybe aren't in her wheelhouse, right? Um, I remember a trip that I took in 2002, and I was gone for two whole weeks training. Um, I called the house every single night. Uh, we had a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old at home. <laughs> and I was so relieved when I got home and that everything was still okay. Uh, but what if I had left and told my wife, Julie, hey, uh, I don't know when I'm coming back. But I think it'll be soon. What? <laughs> you know, uh, please, see the kids are fed, make sure John, Ben gets to school on time, and take care of things for me while I'm gone. That's a pretty weighty matter, isn't it? You know, and, and when we married, uh, we partnered together for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, right? That's what, that's what marriage is about. But neither of us knew whether the future would hold good things or bad things. Uh, but we had said when we, when we married, no matter what, I am for you. I am with you. I will work for you. That's what it's about, right? Beloved, we who are believers are also pledged to someone who has left us but said he's coming back. Jesus has given us his word that he will return, but he just can't say when. Near the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 24 and 25, we find seven parables of the kingdom of God. These are a response that Jesus is giving a response to some questions the disciples had. Um, essentially, they teach us certain things that are foundational about our relationship with the Lord. He's setting, you know, the Lord is in a sense setting the stage for his disciples because in a very short period of time, he will be crucified, dead, buried, three days later rise again, and then just 50 days later, he will be leaving them for an indefinite period of time. Today's message is thematic, like I said. There's going to be um, several themes that we see in these parables. These are the four themes. Uh, we're going to look at three of the four today. No one knows when. And that is to say when Jesus returns or even we don't even know the day of our death. Right? Secondly, be on the alert. Be prepared. There are signs and seasons to see. Mm -hmm. And then Christ's coming is like a thief. What does that mean? And lastly, we will all give an accounting of how we lived our lives. So let me give you the big idea. Um, the big idea is that since Jesus is our bridegroom, we should be ready and eager to see him come. 
We are responsible to use what the Lord has given us for the advancement of the kingdom, and we will give an accounting for what we did with the lives that we owe to him. Brothers and sisters, what the Bible teaches us is that we are to live holy, expectant lives, always preparing and making sure that we shine for Jesus. So let's look at these. The first theme, no one but the Father knows when. And the verses that we get that from are Matthew 24, 35, and 36. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. You see, Jesus himself does not know the day of his return. But he has given us his word, and his word is gold, isn't it? Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word is eternal. Amen? Isn't it precious he tells us that? I want you to think about uh, those who, whose word you really trust. Perhaps it's a spouse or a, a parent, a friend whom you've shared your deepest heartaches and joys, right? There are people we share our word with and we, we trust them with it. Um, why, why is it that we, we do that? We do it because we, 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 our heart is knit to them. We love them, right? That's how that happens. But I want you to think now of someone that you used to trust but who betrayed you. That changes it, doesn't it? There's, here you had your heart knit to someone. You shared something that was kind of important and they betrayed you in some fashion or form. That's heavy. And it's all the more heavier because that's what betrayal is. It's a betrayal of the trust. Betrayal hurts because of the relationship that we had. It's now torn. It's broken. And you know, human relationships are like that. Even those who haven't broken a trust like that with you, but, you, but you've, you, sometimes, you know, they, they let you down, don't they? We, 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 sometimes we let those who trust us down. It's, it's kind of the, the, uh, the issue of human frailty. You know, a plan that was made is broken due to illness or, you know, some other trouble, maybe a car trouble, whatever, right? It could be a variety of things. We give a pass on broken promises like that. It's right. We should give a rain check, right? But we shouldn't have to do that, in a sense. Beloved, there is no heaven on earth. But there is a heaven. Amen? <laughs> Don't you long for it? It shouldn't be that we have to, you know, worry about human frailty and not be able to keep our word at times. But it is that way sometimes. We have to pay, have patience and bear with our own frailty and with that of others. But you know what? We have hope. We have hope because of Christ. He is our betrothed. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All our frailties. And so whether you have to bear with someone or they have to bear with you, our hope is not in good circumstances or having a good day. But our hope is in Christ because we have everything we need for life and godliness. He has given us his holy, sure word, a word that does not pass away, that he will return. Amen? So let me ask you, how does not knowing when Jesus will return help us to live holy, expectant lives for Christ? So I'm going to shamelessly steal or borrow from our brother Nate, who was here a couple of weeks ago preaching, and he gave an illustration from his own job and his own life, and I thought it was perfect for this. So I'm just going to repeat it, okay? He mentioned that he used to have a job site where the boss would occasionally just leave without telling anybody where he was going or how long he would be gone. And sometimes he was gone for up to even two weeks. <laughs> now, um, you know, just as suddenly as he, gone, he was gone, suddenly he shows up one day. 
Well, you, you, you can, I imagine that would be a little unsettling as an employee, a laborer who's working, right? Well, is he coming in today? Well, I don't know. He's the boss. He can come in if he wants. <laughs> well, what should I be doing? Everything that I'm supposed to be doing, right? It puts a little bit of weight upon you. Um, now, there could be two different motivations that would keep the guys working, right? One might be fear, right? Um, well, I don't want to be caught not doing my job and the boss show up. That's bad news because he's going to do what a boss is supposed to do, <laughs> right? Um, but it also could be out of love and respect for the guy or the gal because they, 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 they have earned the right to be in the position they're at because they've been a hard worker. And, well, you, you want to honor that. Sometimes you have good working relationships. Not always, okay? But this, you see, there's two different motivations that could potentially, no matter what you do, his showing up suddenly will certainly keep the men jumping, right? Um, so which of these motivations should we have towards Jesus at his return? Fear? Oh, he's going to catch me. Or, or love. Well, in a sense, it's a trick question. There should be, in a sense, a holy fear that we always have for, for the Lord Jesus, okay? But at the same time, that fear is a reverential fear, a love, because of what he did for us. And all we have to do to be reminded about that is look at that cross, right? So we, we know we are... We, we, we are captured and held by him in that way. Beloved, Jesus is not our boss. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. But to his church, to his chosen ones, he's our husband. Or you could say our bridegroom. Are you a believer in Jesus? Then by virtue of your membership in Christ or in the church, you are his bride, okay? And he's your bridegroom. So let me give you a brief account of what this might look like. Uh, I'm going to give you an example, a story from history. Some of you will know this, some of you will not, and some may not know all the details. Um, in 1956, five missionaries went to some Indians in South America, I don't know the, the nation specifically, but they, they were known as the Aukas, but, but that really wasn't their name. They were the Waudanis. And all five of these men, after two years of prepara preparation, all five of these men, they thought, ah, we're going to be able to do this. We've got a friendly response. We've been working with this for many years now. They were stabbed with spears and murdered on the beach and left their bodies were laying in the sand. Beloved, these men, they spent years in school preparing for their life's work. Um, let me give you their names and some of their family history here. Jim Elliott, he was 28 when he died. He had a wife and a daughter. And uh, you might know the wife's name. Her name is Elizabeth Elliott. That name might ring a bell. Then you've got Nate Saint. He was also a missionary. He was a pilot. He had three kids and a wife. And one of his kids might ring a bell. His name was Steve Saint. Um, but he was only 32 when he died. Ed McCulley, another missionary, a medic. And he had even trained to, to be a lawyer initially. He spent a whole year in law school. He was a learned man, but he was called to the mission field, so he abandoned the legal field, took enough classes for a medical uh, training to be used in the missionary endeavor, and went to Wheaton College, where all these men met. Okay. Then Ed McCulley. Um, or that was Ed McCulley, I'm sorry. Then there's Pete Fleming. He was the youngest man. He was engaged, we know that, but he, there's not a whole lot of history on him. He's only 27 years old when he passed. But he spent four years in school and preparing the whole time. And then Roger Udurian, 31 years old, a missionary. He, was, he, he also had um, fought in World War I. He was a paratrooper in England. He enlisted in, in 43 because of the war. He had two kids and a wife. 
These men and their loved ones willingly followed the Lord's plan for their lives. They gave up their plans. And hopes because they had a calling to serve. They, were they more holy than we are? No. No. But they forsook the things of the world for a greater reward, a reward the world doesn't always esteem. Beloved, the, the death of these five men was the catalyst for their families to reach the savage warriors. We, so, we kind of look at it sometimes when we say, look at all the, all the training, all the, all the study, and it's gone in an instant. It was a waste, was it? That little tribe is not, probably, I believe it's over 50% Christian today. And let me, let me give you a little history on how that all happened. Two years after the death of their husbands, two of the wives, Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot, returned to the tribe having made a, a friendly contact enough. And Elizabeth brought her daughter with. And uh, eventually Rachel had her son, who was off at a, at a school, join them when he was 10. He was only six years old when his dad died. So from the age of 10 on, he was with these, this tribe. He developed relationships with some of the men, even who had killed his father. And so in June of 65, he was baptized by two of the men who did actually kill his father because they had become believers. Isn't that amazing? It just, it just strikes me. I asked my father-in-law. He went to Wheaton College and was a, was a student there right after this happened. So it was a big deal. The lives of Rachel and Elizabeth were a holy living witness to the grace of God. And the hearts of these tribesmen were moved to love and to Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So... We're on to our second theme. Be on the alert. Get ready. Be prepared. There are signs and seasons to see. Okay, the parable of the fig tree reads like this. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Now, as surely as spring follows uh, winter, just like plants, they sprout in the spring, right? That's how sure Christ is coming. Now, we, we, sometimes we forget that. I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Peter talks about how in later days that... There will be mockers who, who say, oh, when is he coming again? They've been saying that for thousands of years. Oh, don't fall into that trap. It's a certainty. Just like the spring always comes. Just like the summer always falls spring. It will happen. It will happen. The Father in heaven is holy and righteous and will not allow his bride, the church, to go through waters of adversity that he did not plan. Yeah, we sometimes live in troubled times, okay? Um, I want you to think about the curse for a moment. Women in childbirth have a painful delivery. Those who have to work do so by dealing with thorns and thistles and in the, the sweat of their brow. Work is hard! It's not supposed to be hard, but it is. In fact, if you look in the Bible, you'll see that we were supposed to be working before the curse. We were supposed to tend the garden. All creation groans because of our sin. And this is, this is a good thing. It's good because when we put our hand to the fruit, we took the prerogative of God. God is constantly trying to remind us and show us we were wrong. He is Yahweh. He decides where we live, when we live, and the circumstance of our lives. We who live are to take this to heart. It's our job to remember the goodness of God. Okay? When he, we, when he made man, he made us in his image. Image bearers placed in the garden of God. Have you thought about the garden of God, actually? You know, it's one of those things. We, we, we sometimes call it a metaphor for heaven. 
But you know, brothers and sisters, in a sense, although it is a metaphor, it is no metaphor. There once was a time heaven was on earth. That's what that's telling us. And you know how we get that feeling sometimes, uh, that feeling of for, a, for a simpler time or a time of youth or maybe we sometimes think a time of innocence. You know, I believe that is because God puts it in our hearts and reminds us there was once a time there was heaven here. And it's a reminder that, there, that even though heaven here has been destroyed because of our sin and the curse, heaven is still here. And we can have hope. So let me ask you this. Same question as before. How does knowing that, this, that there are signs and seasons help us to live holy, expectant lives? Isn't it the case that our Lord wants us to know, to be ready, to be looking for his coming, but he couldn't tell us when? He explicitly says that we will have signs and seasons that help us identify his coming. And you know, all you have to do is look at the first coming of Christ. Weren't there things that identified the Messiah then? There sure were. He would be born in Bethlehem. Check. He would be born of a virgin. Check. He would perform miracles. Check. You know, I was looking it up. I don't know the exact number, but there's more than 300 prophecies that he fulfilled when he came the first time. And there are lists where you can see the prophecy and the fulfillment very clearly. You can find those lists out there, but 300, we're not going through that this morning. <laughs> but that tells you the, 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 the amount of evidence that was there for his first coming. And, and you know what's interesting? There's actually more than 700 prophecies of the Messiah. Some have not yet been fulfilled because Jesus is going to come again. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about that was the rabbis of those days did not distinguish that. They just saw that the Messiah will come. And, they, and, and some of those passages talk about him coming as a conquering king. And, and that's what they latched on to. And in, in the whole midst of all that, they missed the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. They missed the, all the prophecies of Jesus coming to die. But they were right there, right under their noses. And you know, it would be real easy for us to miss the same thing. So keep your eyes open. They're there for us to look for. We can find them in the, in the scriptures. Jesus is indeed coming again. And there will be signs and seasons accompanying his second coming just like his first. Let me give you another example. Um, a story from history. Another one. I think I actually shared this before, but... Maybe not. Consider Elizabeth Ten Boom, also known as Betsy. Some of you, so Ten Boom sounds familiar. You might know about Cory Ten Boom, right? That's Elizabeth's sister, because Cory Ten Boom is the only survivor of her family of the Holocaust. She was part of that story that we sometimes know about. You saw the movie maybe called The Hiding Place. She, and there's a book written, okay? Her, Elizabeth's story, though, is recorded in there alongside of Corey's, because Corey told the story of her father, of, of her whole family, beforehand and all the way through. So you get the history there, and it's a beautiful story. She lived in a Christian home. Holy expectant living was on display for all to see. In fact, during the two years that they were in the, the hiding place, or that they had a hiding place for the Jews, when Jews were there, they, they sat them down at the dinner table and they had Christian devotions with them. Corey and Betsy went off to some of the darkest concentration camps that we even know of. And Betsy actually died six months only before the end of the war. When you hear that, it just kind of makes you grieve. You're like, oh my, so close, yet so far away, right? Yet her witness to her sister Corey saw Corey through. By her own account, she was becoming bitter. Corey hated the Germans and what they had done to her family. She saw all of them dying one by one. And now her sister dies. Yet 
Through the entire endeavor, her sister kept testifying to God's love. Even in her weakened state, love prevailed. Betsy lived a holy expectant life to the very end and passed on that same holy expectation to her sister. And we only know that story because her sister did live. And we have that. Isn't that a great blessing to us? We don't know the circumstance of our lives, but he does, and he places us where and when he does for his purpose. We're just to be faithful. So the last one is Christ's coming is like a thief. And this one is, is found here in Matthew 2, 42 to 44. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what time of the day the thief was coming, he would have been alert and not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Now, there's actually a total of five passages that speak of Jesus' return as a thief. And honestly, when I, every time I see this, it kind of bugs me. I mean, this is King Jesus. How can, he, how can we say he's a thief? But he's, he's not saying he is a thief. He's using one attribute of thievery, that of unexpectedness, right? And, and since Jesus is the one bringing us the illustration, we can't argue with it, can we? Thieves never announce their schedule ahead of time, do they? That'd be really, really convenient, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, oh, there's five passages that talk about Jesus, Jesus coming as a thief. We're not going to look at all five of them. We're only going to look at the one we just did and then this one here in 1 Thessalonians. So let me read these verses to you. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. Now, as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them uh, suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day would take you, overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night or of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. So the question of the timing of Christ's return is what's being dealt with, right? And, and that's an area of friction in Christian circles these days. Um, I'm not going to give you any sort of timeline or anything like that because that's not what Jesus or Paul is getting at here. They are, are bringing it primarily to answer questions. So Paul, Paul got a question in a, in a letter, something to the effect of, will my brother in the Lord, who's already passed on, is in, is in the grave, is he going to miss the coming of the Messiah the second time? Jesus said he's coming again, but he's gone. So Paul answers that question. And later, you know, of course, the answer to that, of course, is they won't miss the coming. Those who died will first see Jesus, and then we will be translated. But, you know, this is, this is where they were at. Later in that same church, they began to focus so much on the coming of the Lord that some of them stopped working, they became lazy. And the bottom line is they were too busy focusing on the return of the Lord without working alongside of it. Yes, we are to live holy, expecting, expectant lives, but we don't sit on our duff while we do it. We have to work. We're supposed to shine for Jesus. They were in, for, in danger of forgetting that we are to be preparing as we wait, ultimately. That's what it's about. The Lord wants to see his church working. As we work, we will long for the kingdom even more. Because work is hard, isn't it? Just like I said in the beginning. 
So once again, let me ask you the question, how does knowing that Jesus will come unexpectedly to those who do not know him help us live holy, expectant lives? Because we who know the Lord will not be caught by surprise, the scripture says, because we will have those signs. We're, we're, even though we don't know the day or the hour, we know the season, right? So we will not be caught, you know, unexpectedly. But here's, here's the answer to this. If, if, if we feared the return of Jesus, what does that say about our relationship to him? It says there's some issues, isn't it? Um, it's it's kind of like, uh, this is a, a hard illustration, but it's like the battered wife whose husband cannot approach her anymore. That's not the way we should be with the Lord. Instead, with, with respect to the Lord, Consider how he gently calls us to serve. And I think I've got this verse here. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You know, a yoke is a tool for work. But he doesn't say that we will have no burdens. He just says that the burdens will be light. And I think compared to the burden of carrying our own sin that we once bore. You know, and, and that's the light that we need to shine to the rest of the world as we live. Right? We no longer have the weight of the penalty of sin on us. And with a sanctified life, we don't feel the pain of our sins as much because we don't sin as frequently. And when we do, we're grieved by it. Because we, we know that our sins sent him to the cross. So, since Jesus is our bridegroom, we should be ready and eager to see him come. We are to live holy, expectant lives, always be preparing and always making sure we shine our light for Christ. None of us knows what the future holds. How are you using your life for the glory of the king and the kingdom? I'm not sure. Here we are. Okay, so I should have had that up there. This is what Paul says in Colossians, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's our mission. No matter the circumstance of our life, no matter the job that's sitting before us day by day, the mundane tasks or the hard tasks, live joyfully. Give people a reason to know and hope. That, that a reason that they, they can take of that, that achiness in their own heart and say there's actually something to this. And God is good. Amen? Are you eager to see his arrival? Make the kingdom of God a priority and the king your desires. Let a holy expectation for God and his kingdom permeate his life. Now today we looked at several themes found in the kingdom parables. Uh, no one knows when, the Lord's return or your death. Be on the alert. Be prepared. There are signs and seasons to see. And Christ's coming is like a thief. Next week, we're going to look at just one of those parables, specifically the parable of the talents. It's Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, if you want to look it up. And the theme in that parable is we will all give an accounting of how we lived our lives. Jesus promised us he will return, and we should be ready and eager to see him come. Amen.